Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Grand Rounds. Uh, my name is Tom Farden. I'm the chair of Grand Rounds, and uh, thanks very much for coming out today uh, for our very special guest, uh, who I feel uh, embarrassed now by talking about uh, in very fondly. So, in um, in 2003, perhaps 2004, it's all a bit of a blur. Um, I went to the respiratory department meeting uh, down in East Block, and uh, I didn't know anybody apart from Robin. Um, but I was a bit scared of him, and uh, and there was this cardiology SHO, and uh, we can call them SHOs because that's what they were then. Um, and this cardiology SHO was there, and he was like a box of frogs. He was bouncing around this, the, the, in in this block seminar room, organising everything and sorting everything out. I thought, who the hell is this nutcase? <laughs> and uh, I said, don't worry, that's that's mother. <laughs> it's fine. And then a few years later, we became registrars together in the spiritual service, and um, we became this somewhat infamous, perhaps, team of, uh, uh, of registrars, which was me and, and, and Mudder, and you'll remember Stuart Skembury. So the three of us together was an interesting mix of people. But over the years, I got to know Mudder and his family, uh, and learned an awful lot from Mudder, and uh, continued to, to do so. And all the time I knew him, he always said that he would go back to Iraq, the place of his birth, um, to give back to his, his home country, to take what he'd learnt at Dundee University and then in NHS Tayside and take it back to the people of his homeland. And at the time, Iraq was a place of conflict, a place of war, uh, and a place that we were very worried about him going back to. Um, and I think you know, we, we all had... We were all very worried about him going, but we knew he was going to go anyway. Uh, and after a brief sojourn in Yorkshire, in Doncaster, he finally left and went to Iraq in 2013, yeah, um, to try to set up the first respiratory specialist centre in Iraq. Um, and he's here today to tell us about how he managed that, the trials and tribulations. Um, the difficulties in bringing up his young family in, in southeast Iraq, uh, getting the money, the political struggles, just living in what was a war-torn country. Um, and uh, I've only spent half an hour with Mudder just now in my office, uh, and we walked from my office in East Block to here, and we couldn't go more than about 10 yards without somebody stopping to hug Mudder. Um, uh, and he's just the same. He's still the mad box of frogs kid that I met in 2003, but he just happens to be running a respiratory service in Iraq that looks after 15 million people, suddenly expanding in the next year to 40 million people. Uh, okay, I'll say no more. I'm looking forward to hearing what he has to say, and a very warm welcome to Muda al Kaula. Do I need to put this on? Or? I usually walk stay about. For, stay in front of the microphone because we need, we're videoing you. Ah, this is Don't want that. Okay. I, I find that really difficult to stay. Um, as I've grown older, I'm 41 now, um, I found it really difficult to keep my emotions and hold my tears back. So just, I don't want any laughter or making fun of me when I'm, I might, you might see the odd emotional burst. <laughs> um, I'm very fond of Dundee because I grew up in Dundee. I went to medical school here and things have changed dramatically. I remember when I was a first year medical student, I stood over there and I remember we presented something on the colon when I was doing anatomy or something and Professor Forbes was sat somewhere there and sort of giving me the, what you're talking about sort of thing. Things have sort of progressed. I've chosen this uncharted territory. Now in Iraq it's mainly desert. Don't think there's like snow or ice in Iraq, it's predominantly desert. Um, but to me, the reason why I've chosen this is because Iraq is uncharted territory, and I'll share some of my experience since I've been to Iraq with everybody here. Um, I thought it would be nice to see one end product from what Dundee University has done in, in terms of training me and what that has provided in terms of services in Iraq in the future. So I'll always be indebted to Dundee and Dundee University. Um, <clears throat> so, we'll talk, we'll, we'll, I've got a chest infection, ironically, as well, by the way. 
uh, setting up spiritual services in the south of Iraq from the primitive to the advanced. I'll talk a little bit detail what I, what I mean by primitive. Um, I'll just share this with you, which I was going through the other day, and, and, and probably I can't see Dougie Elder. Or is, he is he in Perth? And Max, is Max here yet? Or Max was going to be here somewhere. I don't know where he's disappeared to. But the people from my year and from, from my years in medical school. And I was just going through that, just sort of a bit of nostalgia and what have you. And uh, I sort of, this is what I looked like with the uh, alopecia that you guys can see here, alopecia areata. We're not talking about dermatology today, but... Uh, and then I noticed some sort of crazy thing that I've put here. Not only that I was thinking of embarking in a career in neurology and infectious diseases, <laughs> but I've put something like, his alternative career is Iraqi president. <laughs> so I was thinking, that must have been... This was 2000, and 2000 2001. So the crazy idea of going to Iraq does have a, a long-standing background. <clears throat> so today I'll share three years I went to settle in Iraq. I started, I set the wheels in motion in 2013, as Tom mentioned, but I settled in 2015 with my family because I reckoned it was difficult to build anything in Iraq without actually living there. So I'll talk a little bit so that's the, the, about that background and then 2015, 2018, I'll try and summarise it. And often I like to put lots of pictures in my presentations, but uh, this time I actually did a documentary-style video, which I've stuck on YouTube. Um, Tom accessed it because he keeps... Keep yes, he keeps searching with al and what's he up to every so often, so he's already had a sneak preview to that video, so I'll, I'll share that at the end, and it sort of summarises some of the stuff that I've done in Iraq. <clears throat> Whenever we mention Iraq... I get this look of condolence. Oh, really? Oh, that's terrible. Is it safe? Well, the year where we had the Manchester bombing and the two episodes in, in London, in three or four years, we had only one episode of a terrorist atrocity in Nazaria. So if you look at statistics, it was actually safer in Nazaria than it is in the UK. But I think it, it was because it was no longer news to people, and that's why even the condolence started to waver. This is a picture of a girl outside a famous atrocity that occurred in a district called Karada in Baghdad, and it touched at the hearts of people. That this, this particular explosion um, killed about 330 people who were shopping for the Christmas equivalent, eat in Iraq three days prior to that and they used napalm so a mixture of a gelling agent with gasoline to inflict not just death but a very painful death living with that reality is extremely difficult and I think you have to have nerves of steel um, to be able to work and share a lot of these stories and anecdotes in Iraq but nevertheless it is extremely rewarding when you feel that you're offering people who've struggled to the extent that they would rather drown in the Mediterranean than live in such circumstances. So I suppose part of me was thinking and inspired to do something that will prevent them from crossing the Mediterranean and drowning. I can set up a respiratory service and it'll be really lovely. You can stay with me, don't go, don't go, sort of thing. And the other thing as well that you hear a lot about in the news and uh, is the proxy wars that happen in Iraq often. So instead of them having war in their own country, they think this is a country that no longer has sovereignty. It's got different sects, different religions. Um, there's a struggle for power in the Middle East. And uh, so we get these proxy wars where people take the battle into the country that has nothing to do with these proxy wars. And sadly, um, at the time of Saddam, I still remember Hugh D. L. sat in the back when he was fond of the guy who kept on lying about that the Americans hadn't entered Baghdad despite the fact they were across the river with their tanks etc um, there's a lot of denial in Iraq in the time of Saddam there's still denial about what democracy means in Iraq I think in a positive my personal view is Iraq is heading towards secularism which I think is good for Iraq and people will learn that differences are resolved through debate and dialogue rather than bullets. Um, and I hope that there is a, a bright future ahead for Iraq in that sense. 
In 2016, under severe duress, healthcare in Iraq was the term used and published in the Lancet. 14 major hospitals and 170 other healthcare facilities have been rendered non functional or destroyed. That has a massive impact on a population that struggles to um, receive health care. This was an article published a year before in the Lancet Respiratory. Miles Witham contacted me. Is Miles here? No? No, he's moved to Newcastle. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I do actually know that he moved to Newcastle. I don't know why I'd forgotten. But Miles Witham sent me, um, get, got me in touch with a journalist, a freelance journalist with the, the Lancet Respiratory, and she came to Iraq. We spent about a couple of weeks together where she thought I was absolutely nuts what I was doing there um, and we published this article called Breathless, Breathless in Iraq in, in Arabic Dr Ali sat there he'll know what I mean Mahnoug Mahnoug means I'm suffocating so when you say Breathless in Iraq it doesn't just d- denote a problem with respiratory primitive services but it means that I'm struggling to breathe in Iraq because of the situation there so she came along Annabelle Vandenberg and she covered this story and published it in the Lancet Respiratory and at the time what happened was I had a, an agreement with the National Health Service equivalent in the Ministry of Health to set up a, a respiratory unit for the whole of Iraq and that was the first of its kind a fully functioning pulmonary function lab it's got all these different extensions you'll see in the video this is my middle daughter trying out CPEX there's lack of regulation there, so you can just bring your family to test out all the kits, etc. Uh, the body box and the rest of the machinery. Unfortunately, this only lasted this only lasted for a while, three months before funding was cut because of austerity, mismanagement, corruption, etc. Um, and I was able to set it up at the time before it went fell on its head with David. I worked in Doncaster for a while as a chest physician, a lung cancer lead, and I did specialisation in non-cancer palliative medicine. Um, and David was one of our respiratory physiologists, and he published his work in Inspire. And it was absolutely brilliant to have David along. Um, the funny thing was, whenever we spoke in English to everybody, they could understand, but when we spoke with each other, it was like Tom and I speaking Yorkshire. People just don't understand what we're talking about. So then, when that collapsed, this was so. This was I set it up, and the official opening by the Ministry of Health, Minister of Health, it collapsed in August. So after three months, it completely collapsed. Um, I had lost a lot of money by that point because I'd taken a career break without salary, etc. So was it time to raise the white flag? Was there a Plan B? At the time, this is what Plan B felt like, quite literally. Um, James Chalmers would be interested in to hear this, but I developed bronchiectasis is when I was in Iraq. And there were times when I was extremely sick, uh, massive hemoptysis because of infections, etc. We didn't have isolating units uh, to protect us. Um, and uh, there were times when it was so hard that I'd wake up in the morning, not depressed, but just thinking, I'd rather not wake up than be defeated that was, that was the hardest point so that's 2015, 2016 it was a time when our earnings, my family and I my wife couldn't come today because she's got a chest infection as well <laughs> and she thinks I'm a rubbish doctor because I can't get rid of the cough and she doesn't understand post-viral cough, post-viral Tussive syndrome anyway um, so um, that was pretty hard I think there were times when our earning was about 80 quid a month so that was, that was tough so then I thought, right, so I've put the NHS logo on the back of my shirt there in that picture, scratching my head. I realised at the time that most healthcare service and where people had trust in healthcare was actually in the private sector. But that was, going up in the NHS, that was like a dirty thing to go into. Private sector, that's for people who are money hungry, who have got no ethics, who this, that and the other. And it's been an eye-opener for me, actually. Um, it's been an eye-opener in the sense that I found it so beneficial in many ways compared to I hope we don't have socialists sat in the crowd Um, but it's been an eye-opener to me 
the experience that I've had in the private sector in, in many ways. I'll touch on them during the talk. The other thing that I did, which was crucial, was I was thinking, okay, I've got my medical degree, I've got my subspeciality in respiratory, uh, I'm a general physician, but to build an institution that is that carries a lot of my core values from scratch in Iraq, my medical degree wouldn't be enough. So I stumbled across these great books written by Jim Collins, uh, this one here is written by Poras, Good to Great, Good to Great in the Social Sector and Built to Last. Absolutely brilliant books. I spent about a couple of years studying these books. The first, I remember the first sentence in Good to Great, Beware of Good, the Enemy of the Great. Never settle for good. It's the, always the enemy of the great. Extremely inspiring books. And what they did was they looked at visionary companies. And I'll tell you how they defined what a visionary company is. And you can see there's, there are familiar names. Hula Packard, General Electric, Ford, Walmart, Walt Disney, whatever, Sony. And they compared them against comparison companies. So they didn't compare them against any company. They compared them against the silver medalist, the bronze medalist in the world. And it was based on approximately 75, 100 years where, as they started, the general market from starting from one American dollar, US dollar, the general market would go up to $415. So that would be a successful enterprise. The comparison companies I showed, their share jumped by 1,000. So they were doing really well. The visionary companies and why they were chosen as visionary companies jumped 6,000 times. So they were doing something different. And the thing that was really interesting when, you, when I read those books and I studied them really hard that one of the main reasons why these visionary companies did really well was because their primary outcome wasn't shareholder status and making money. Merck, for example, discovered, invented treatment for river blindness and then discovered that the people who suffer from river blindness don't have any money, don't have any means to shift the drugs to Africa. So they basically paid for it all because one of their core values was to preserve the scientists that worked amongst their institutions so they wouldn't feel that their work was futile and pointless, etc. And they did really well and became a visionary company. And one of the things, many, many things in these books that they talk about is this Chinese philosophy of yin-yang. So you have what you presume are two opposing factors, but they do complement each other. So what these companies did, and this is what I did in creating this institution, is set a, a, a number of core values <clears throat> and you can stimulate progress as long as you don't undermine the core value that you thought of in the first place. So for example, I thought these core values are things that I really believe in. So healthcare that is of high quality, high standard, Services that is affordable to everyone, teamwork ethos, training, research and development, creating an institution and promoting ambulatory care to reduce the burden <coughs> on inpatient beds at the hospital. I thought these are nice core values to start off with, especially when you work as a consultant and you fi often find that this is a problem here in a massive institution such as the NHS. So for example, this kid who's got cerebral palsy for about four years, he had disrupted sleep hygiene because he was suffering from simple asthma. This wasn't severe asthma, it was simple asthma. And you can see consistently that he seeked help in the public and private sector, but people were giving him outdated medicines based on their training, didn't conform to what guidelines said, partly because they hadn't kept themselves up to date, but more importantly because the type of system that was poorly regulated in the private sector meant the number of patients you see will determine your income. So if we go back to core value, if I want quality of care, I will not deal with such cases by, you know, if I need more to make more income to pay for whatever, it means that instead of seeing more patients, if I allocated in the five hours that each doctor would see 20, I wouldn't resolve the issue to undermine my core value by saying to them, you can start seeing 40. You will abuse their good, goodwill factor because they were paid the same. <clears throat> you will undermine the quality of care that you provide to that particular patient. 
So in order to stimulate progress in that yin-yang, I have to think of a way that would protect such a patient but would allow it to make more income. So an answer would be, for example, train more doctors, train more specialist nurses who can deal with the time allocated that you need to deal with these patients so that it doesn't compromise the quality of care that you give them, yet you are stimulating progress. And there's about a million examples of these, but I just thought I'd share one. So based on those principles, we opened this thing called Viqar lung diseases. Viqar is in the south of Iraq. It's one of the provinces in Iraq. Um, and it's a, a specialist respiratory center. Now, officially recognized by the government, the government, of course, recognizes all the public sector uh, healthcare providers, a few private hospitals scattered around the country, but in terms of a specialized unit, this was the first to be recognized by the Ministry of Health. And why that is important is because when I'm wanting extra guards or I'm talking to whoever, billing me in terms of electricity, if I'm wanting to train candidates, etc., you have to officially, it has to be officially recognized. And this is awaiting publication in the G Journal of Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh. It's a busy slide. The idea, I'll highlight lung cancer, for example, the idea was for me to track how I was getting on in developing the services. So, for example, lung cancer services prior to the Qar lung diseases, TQLD, there was not much in the way of advanced medicine. This changed significantly when TQLD was opened in terms of Interventions that allowed us to, I mean, I mean, this allow, that allowed to. Every time somebody comes, I get all these memories that are weird. Like I remember the pass that Mike and Miller gave me, and I volleyed it into the corner of the net and stuff like that. Or when Morag, when Morag Baron was, I was the house of her, and she looked, she looked after me when she was my SHO, not to give away your age, Morag, and stuff like that. <laughs> so. We are making significant move, so I'm tracking these, and I'm hoping that the things that are not yet readily available, for example, in the context of lung cancer, PET CT imaging to help you understand how much the disease has spread, and, and many other examples that I'll not go into, but there is significant improvement once I went into the private sector in Iraq. But we mustn't forget that fundamentals are first. So instead of having all this fancy equipment where you'd be able to diagnose rare and wonderful you must remember that the basics and the fundamentals of smoking cessation, take an inhaler properly, effectively your technique etc so this woman had a cavitating lesion on her chest x-ray, she smoked what I worked out at the time as 200 pack years, I'm pretty sure she smokes 200 pack years, she doesn't sleep much and she was obsessed with I just don't want to have TB that's what it means and I was uh, I think it's cancer but well let's just keep this hush hush so you can see her son and aunt it's a different sort of cultural mix where they're sort of winking at the back and doing that sort of thing don't tell her don't you dare tell her whatever you're thinking so it puts you in a bit of a predicament you don't know what to do to them how do you obtain consent for them to undergo a procedure that could have potential complications etc but she was very happy Eventually, she had um, a lobectomy. It was early stage, squamous cell carcinoma, and she was very happy. She still doesn't know that she's got cancer. <laughs> <laughs> Which is something I probably wouldn't get away with here in the UK. Um, and it's sometimes difficult to gauge, isn't it? You sort of say, even when I was in Dumcastle, and I was briefly in Dundee, I'd go, to, go up to them, are you the type of person that wants me to tell you everything? So that sort of cue usually says... No, I'm a coward. And he sort of stepped back. Yeah, tell me everything. But I remember doing this once when I was in neurology SHO, and this policeman, really massive chap with big moustache in the neurology ward, Dr. Oreden, Jonathan Oreden, still around? So Jonathan was his consultant, and he said, uh, he came along, the, the, the investigations were basically MS, his MRI scan report and his LP results. And he said, just tell me, just tell me, he used to call me Dr. Al, just tell me, Dr. Al, what is it? Tell me. I was like, no, the consultant has to tell you and stuff. And he just pushed me. And it was late hour. I didn't think Dr. Eden would come back. Just tell me. I can handle it. So I said MS. And this guy collapsed on the floor crying. That minute, Jonathan Eden came along. He's like, what have you done? Sort of thing. <laughs> so um, over there, it's a little bit easier. So this institution now, I started from literally myself, sticking candy in people, fixing the 
tap in the toilet that doesn't work. It now employs 70 plus people in the past couple of two and a half years, three years. And I have six specialist doctors, including a thoracic surgeon, three trainees, who are absolutely lovely. They have huge potential. Shocking how much potential they've got. And I think because they they have this feeling or misconception that because they're in Iraq, they're always going to be behind in the times. So that's all they do. They study. They read a lot. They can quote you all these small print stuff from textbooks. Um, but they don't have the tools to be able to put whatever they learn in practice. So a blood gas machine or bronchoscopy or whatever. We developed a public-private partnership to subsidize the cost for those who can't afford it, and that works really well. I started off with a large catchment area, it's about 15 million people, which for those who are familiar with Iraq, it's the province of Misan, Muthanna, Dr. Ali knows what I'm talking about, um, Basra, Kut, etc. And now is the population of Iraq is 40 million. Iraq is the size of France. So now I'm getting people from Mosul, Zaho, the south, everywhere. They even catch a plane to come to Azria. It's not as good as the guy from Israel that came to James, though, whatever that was. <laughs> Um, we developed, and that's one thing that I'm really proud of, um, when I was lung cancer lead in Doncaster, I was really interested in streamlining the, the pathway, and I had this programmer, and they told me she's a creme de la creme, she's absolutely brilliant and all the rest, and I struggled to, to advance a system that I had in mind. So when I went to Iraq, there was a chap who was in Baghdad, he looked a bit crazy with his hairstyle and hairdo, and he I didn't think he had all his marbles on him. But he was an absolute genius. And we created this program from scratch and that has created a paperless record. And I'll go into that in a minute. And it created the Streamline Clinic Journey, the one-stop clinic, for about 90% of our patients. And in December, uh, we, we, we see on average 2,500, 4,000 patient episodes per month. That was last year. In December, it's the other high end. So it's about 4,000 patient episodes. And we've got a database that I'm trying to make attractive to my colleagues here in, in Nine Wells. Um, the patient journey, when I worked in the NHS, a lot, of, a lot of it felt like that for our patients, and that's what the feedback they gave me, especially for complex diseases or when you have suspected lung cancer and the deadline of 32 days to diagnosis, 62 days to treatment pathway, and it felt like that for a lot of them. And I, I, I hated that, and I, and I felt myself stuck. So I thought it should look something like this. And I thought, well, I've got the freedom to start it from scratch. I can do what I like. I'm in Iraq. Nobody's going to say anything to me. The regulatory body, as long as they know who I am, I'm fine. It's not who you know. It's who you know know who you are. My grandfather, my grandfather owned... I discovered this when I was in Iraq. He owned land, one of the sheikhs there, land size of quarter of Lebanon. I was like, really? <laughs> and Za Sheikh Zaid, if you guys have heard of him, who was the Sheikh that built the United Arab Emirates, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, etc. His older brother borrowed money from my uncle, my mum's uncle. And I didn't realise that. But anyway, th and then I was thinking, I'm, I'm, I'm living 80 pounds a month. That's just that. So anyway, so this was the pathway that I had in mind. And this pathway with the programme automatically generates a barcoded letter that you can't change. This was a significant milestone in dealing with a lot of patients that come to Iraq and those in, who've worked in Iraq know that it's just a piece of paper, illegible, without a diagnosis and just provide it to the patient. This was actually a significant milestone which can take automatically populated by our nursing staff, a lot of the medication which you scrutinize and then whatever new treatments there are, what ongoing medication, Lots of different figures, electronically signed. So this was a milestone in Iraq. It didn't happen before. And for starting it from scratch, this institution, I'm actually shocked by this, but this institution is now worth £1.78 million. Pounds. It just kept on growing. <laughs> so that, and, I, and I own about... Where's John Dillon? He's disappeared now. I own about 40% of this. I sold my house in Doncaster. It's a lovely house, actually. But anyway... So I sold my house and I put it into this. So um, I found keen investors. I fell out with the initial investor who kept on, why are you not doing a chest x-ray for that patient? He doesn't need it. I don't care he doesn't need it. Do a chest x-ray for that patient. How are you going to make money? And that sort of thing. So I completely fell out with him. Um, 
and I had to fund it myself, basically. Um, and thankfully, it's grown. Uh, that's when a lot of my suicidal ideas happened. <laughs> when I had a lot of debt on my shoulders. I've got 5% of it still shares for those interested to buy any of these shares. It's a growing market. Um, yeah, the, going back to the one-stop clinic. So just picture this with me. Even when I came back to the UK beginning of August, I recall the times when I was in clinic where... A patient would be referred by their GP. It took them about two to three months to be seen. They come and see me. I'm only allowed to see six new patients in a new clinic or 12 follow-up patients or a mixture of both. Um, in Iraq, we see about 20, 25 each in a five-hour slot. Then you've got the dictation that goes to the secretary's office, which usually takes, because of the backlog, a good another two, three weeks. And then... It's just a consultation, and you then send them for all these different investigations where they can have to come back, park at the hospital, have their investigations done. So I, I worked out a lot of my patients when I was in Doncaster would take, and I'm sure that you guys can relate to this, can take up to three, four, five months sometimes before they get the end result of what the outcome was, what the treatment modification should be. In Iraq, 90% of my patients now, it takes them literally two hours. And that's something that I am absolutely shocked in terms of how more, much more you can make a particular health service efficient. This is a bigger catchment area. There is no filtering system through primary care, yet you can see people give them really adequate... And a lot of it is because the information is fresh in your brain. You've just seen them, you've just sent them, the investigations come back, the staff working alongside when you've tell them what the prescription was and you, you, you explained how it should be taken and they sit down with them, etc. It's all fresh in their mind. And they get an appointment and they get a phone call the day before their appointment to be seen. So the crystal ball um, in the future, I'd love to expand. I've not put the, uh, the building here, but my next steps is a lot of people, a lot of colleagues in Iraq have now got the courage and they're thinking of doing something similar. So my next project is going to be trademarked, hoping to build a man-like institution building with a head, arms, body, ENT, ophthalmology, neuro will be in the head. It'll have some sort of restaurant that goes round to look at <laughs> some of the cigarette. Chest will be in the chest, etc. Gastro, gynecology will be other places of course um, but it, this, is, this is something that I'm working really hard on it, I've, I'm, I'm probably going to maybe play the lottery to, fu to quickly fund it but <laughs> otherwise it's going to be really hard to fund it but this is what I'm working on at the moment and I think it will be a landmark building in Iraq I'm also hoping to collaborate a lot more with lots of friends and colleagues in, in the UK um, and instead of incentivizing them to take them to the Marsh Arabs for a nice fish supper um, is to actually create a database where we can do real research collaboration so that we will, you know, through the subgroup analysis, know what sort of, what's unique to that population that we have in Iraq compared to others. And um, I'll leave you guys with a video that I made. It's 10 minutes long, so I hope it doesn't bore you, but it sort of summarizes do you want subtitles in Arabic or English? <laughs> Take it. We'll go with English for that. And then we'll have questions at the end. Uh, the, the sound? Uh, the sound might have to come through. We might have to switch computers. It's okay. Do you want to just uh, freestyle for a little while this day? <laughs> so, so, okay. Okay. Uh, I can connect it to YouTube, don't worry. I'll sort it out. Does anyone have, want to ask Mudu any questions? Whilst uh, does anyone want to give Mudu a massive round of applause spontaneously? <laughs> Quite right. Does anybody have any questions? Just comments, reminiscences, anything you want? And can somebody use to hand the microphone around? Phil, you want to be me for a bit? <laughs> Come on, you want to be me? Run around. Whilst I do this. Anyone got any questions? Anything you want to say? I, can't, I need to do this. I can't do two things at once. Oh, it's Pete's over there. Look. Uh, where, where do I wait to? 
That's probably... <laughs> Little does he know how big he is on that screen. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right, here you go. We should get the sound out of this. Bear with me a second. Uh, sound, sound, sound. Mudder, Mudder, while, while he's doing that, when, when are you going to come back to the NHS and fix the NHS for us? <laughs> It's, it's politicised, and that's a big problem. So you have a, a Labour government with an agenda, for example, um, set the wheels in motion for some projects, and then you get a Conservative government that would probably say, no, this is a bad idea, and you'll never complete that. And I think that's a lot of the, a lot of the problems that we have with the NHS, is that's where they're stuck. In Iraq, I think going from public to private will help corruption, because there won't be room for corruption um, from all these different... Uh, parties and I'm hoping that the government will just work as a regulatory body and uh, as some sort of reimbursement system to those in need or need to require health insurance etc but let the people knowing the, who know the NHS best run it so I do think NHS is heading towards privatisation it's an ageing population, interventions are more expensive, biologics etc hitting the ground quite quickly with a lot of these recent uh, publications so I don't think it's a sustainable... I know it sounds really sad and everything, and people might disagree with me, but I don't think it's a sustainable model anymore. It's just too big. Too big, and it's, uh, there's a lot of... I wouldn't say necessarily corruption, but there's a lot of mismanagement. A lot of mismanagement. I remember Tony Franz once... Um, I requested a blood test, and then he gave me this thing that he'd done and how many bathtubs of blood tests that were needless and useless and the most useless investigation complement of SLE and stuff, and he sort of stuck... When it happened, uh, <laughs> it probably works in Iraq. This, can you log back into that, and we, I might have a solution. Why don't you plug that into here? Well, because I can't do that, and without the VGA thing, and it, um, get it going again, and then we'll try and we'll try this. How that? Oh, <laughs> like that. <laughs> yeah, old school. <laughs> I, I don't want to run about like Tom, but does anyone actually have a question? I will walk over. Anyone at all? Cool. Um, I'll ask one. Um, my name is Pete Fowley. I'm a paediatrician, and you probably know my colleague. You know my colleague Mohammed Ibrahim, or you may know Mohammed. Um, and he is also Iraqi, and he had very similar um, strong feelings about his ties to Iraq. Um, when we went back there to look at some of the services, there was two things that struck me. First of all, they wanted to establish uh, neonatal intensive care services, which is not appropriate in the country when their basic health care is so poor. Um, and the second thing is that the culture and, and social beliefs in Iraq are so very different to the UK that translating an NHS-type model, a, a medical model, is, is not appropriate either. Um, one of the things that did strike me is that, and I think you alluded to it, it's who you know and what your connections are in Iraq that makes the biggest difference, not what your passion or your drive necessarily might be. Um, Mohammed seems to know everyone in the industry, in the, in, in the uh, government departments. Are you the same? Or do, do you have tentacles that go into the, yeah. the, the <laughs> powers? Someone was asking, was it you, Tom, that was asking me about do I need bodyguards, etc.? Yeah. Um, pretty soon, yes, probably will need bodyguards, which is sad, and I don't want that. Um, yes, connected in a big way, but the thing that I did differently from Mohammed, I know a lot of the work that Mohammed done because I go and lecture in Erbil in the north of Iraq. Um, Mohammed came at a time when the public sector was still still had listening ears, still, they still had the hope of creating something similar, like you said, the NHS. But as you said, I realised quite quickly, especially reading these books, especially Built to Last, uh, sorry, Good to Great in the Social Sector, 
and knowing the social differences in Iraq, that you couldn't simply just get the NHS in the UK and replicate that model in Iraq. It's impossible. You had to do something that was unique and best spoke to the need of Iraq, and that's what I tried to create through this. And um, you need, I, I removed myself quite quickly from the public sector because I realized that knowing those people comes at a cost. So whatever you ask them to do, they will want something in return. And that's awful. Um, it's, 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 they think it, it creates some sort of caste system. I'm better than this person. I can jump the queue sort of thing. But now I'm absolutely delighted in the private sector that the only person that jumps the queue quite literally is the one who is unstable based on the triaging nurse assessment. And I get a lot of abuse from it, but they can't do anything about it because I'm free to do what I want. Whereas if it was in the public center, I funded that MRI. It didn't come from this pocket. It came from natural resources and the central government purse, but they don't look at it that way. So I was very careful in terms of, I mean, one, one not just political party, there was another party that offered me four million American dollars to kick off this um, but I declined because of my conscience and because I didn't want them to have that leverage over me. So independence, I think, is the way forward in privatisation. Let's try this. I've rigged up some intricate system of pulleys and wheels. Iraq, to the world in recent decades, is that known as a place of conflict, a place of war, a place of division, a place so desperate? I'll show them. Yeah. To me, there are is a place of okay, my own. Okay. Thank you. Iraq, to the world in recent decades, known as a place of conflict, a place of war. A place of division, a place so desperate. To me, Iraq is a place of my origin, a birthplace of civilization, a place of history and heritage, a place of suffering but courage, a place of hope for peace. Welcome to Nazaria, a city like many others in Iraq, split by a flowing river. It belongs to the Iqar province from which my roots date back. The province is home to the biblical land of Ur, the birthplace of Abraham, and one of the world heritage sites, the beautiful Marsh Arabs. of more than 2 million people, Nazaria and Diqar have seen neglect by a number of passing governments. In 2003, I saw an opportunity to help rebuild this suffering nation. The attraction was the warmth of its people, the rewarding experience in closing the huge gap in healthcare that exists, the dream of building a respiratory institution from scratch which would serve so many in desperate need. There were many branches in medicine requiring immediate attention. Respiratory medicine was particularly primitive. No doubt, this had an impact on my chosen career. In 2013, as an established consultant in respiratory medicine in the United Kingdom, I saw a great opportunity to help set the wheels in motion and place the first building block of my project. saw the birth of the first National Respiratory Centre. There was great excitement, great expectation. Top of the range pulmonary function lab, along with pulmonary interventional theatres. The aim of this project was to create a catalyst that would help advance this branch. However, austerity, corruption and mismanagement meant that the excitement was short-lived. The lack of funding and support 
created a great uncertainty, clearly indicating a fragile project and unsustainable model for the future. This young chap is somebody who has a and he lives in another part of Iraq, in another part of Iraq called Musa. And you've probably heard in the news that there's been a lot of problems about Musa, etc. So I've arranged for him to come all the way to Nazareth so we can do a misguided biopsy. My family and I had mixed feelings about what we should do next. Do we accept defeat and head back to the United Kingdom? Was there a plan B we could contemplate? In August 2015, we agreed to face the upcoming challenge with courage, knowing the adversary we would face required much tenacity. Born and bred in the NHS in the UK, I had mixed feelings about stepping into the private sector in Iraq. The reality was that most healthcare consultations took place in the private sector. Although regulations of the private sector was extremely difficult, it was where people had most trust in receiving healthcare. I set out with a number of unique individuals, a feasibility study, to set up a respiratory service befitting the people of Iraq. I decided to dedicate the next 1,000 weeks, shy of 20 years, to help revolutionize healthcare in Iraq. In June 2016, with the help of investors, we launched BQAR Lung Diseases Speciality Center, otherwise known as TQLD. The first of its kind, now formally recognized by the Ministry of Health. مركز فريد من نوعه بالعراق واعتقد بالمنطقة العربية يعني نوع الميزة اللي حققها المركز هو اقتناء لأجهزة حديثة جدا متطورة واعتماده على نظام مؤتمت لأرشفة المرضى ولتسجيل البيانات ومتابعة الحالات بدقة الأجهزة الحديثة التي يحتويها المركز قادرة على تشخيص مختلف أشكال الحالات التنفسية الأمراض التنفسية بما فيها سرطانات الرئة بما فيها الأمراض القصبية المزمنة والنوبية كالربو وغيرها أيضا قادر على متابعة الحالات الباطنية لوجود مختبر كبير متخصص بمختلف التحاليل المختبرية We established a public private partnership with the existing but struggling public center. The center aimed to significantly alter the current private sector climate, built on a set of core values that we hoped would deliver one day the foundations of a health care system which embraces equality, progress and provides care for all regardless of age or means. A system that would stand the test of time 
as demands and the services grew. Welcome to GQLD, a new experience in triaging and stream lining patients. An advanced hospital information system that not only keeps a detailed digital clinical case record for our patients, but also allows for digital prescriptions, a database for research, and an inbuilt queuing system with the vast majority of patients enjoying a one stop clinic journey experience. <coughs> the patients are welcomed at reception and their details are collected. They then pass to the triaging system to determine basic bedside observations in order to triage the patients based on clinical stability and need. They then consult the team of doctors, often reviewed by more than one doctor, in a friendly and teaching environment. Those who require tests are entered into the system, which allows their smooth journey around the centre in order to complete the results and close the loop by returning to the doctors to discuss their diagnoses and management. A small proportion need more advanced procedures such as bronchoscopy, which is a camera test with the light at the end to view the bronchial tree, or chloroscopy, which is a camera test with the light at the end to view any collections outside the lung. The Twin Centres now employs more than 70 members of staff, senior doctors, junior doctors, nursing staff, pharmacists, technicians, engineers and other professions allied to medicine. It has opened its doors to a catchment area of a staggering 15 million people when looking at all the neighbouring provinces in the southern region of Iraq. It now even attracts Patients from the most northern parts of Iraq, such as Mosul and Zahu, having to travel by plane to reach the centre in the south. In December 2017, the team managed to serve 4,000 patient episodes, albeit exhausting, but equally satisfying. Many people of Iraq don't hold much hope for a bright future ahead. To me, the journey thus far has been full of trials and tribulations. The positive experience I and many others have enjoyed fills me with great hope and optimism. Times are changing for Iraq. Times are changing fast. There we go. That's all that. So I'll turn that off now. There you go. Only Mudder would choose as his background music to that the theme tune from the Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> and it is, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right, I'm going to call things to a close. Mudder's going to hang around a little bit, um, maybe head down to the Ian Lowe, or if you want to have a coffee or tea, or just pat him on the back or whatever. Um, and he's just, uh, but I've got to go because I've got to do bronchoscopy. So um, thanks very much, mate. It's great to see you. Thanks, everyone. Thank <laughs> you.